Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, this is Vivek. I'm speaking with Paul English, uh, the CEO of Kayak, you know, Boston Venture Studio, and 10 other multiple companies and nonprofits. Uh, first of all, Paul, thank you so much for doing this. I'm very, very excited to hear your thoughts of some of the questions I have and qu questions from the audience as well. Um, we have, you know, founders in almost all their stages of, you know, pre-seed founders in the, in the room. We have, you know, people who are in tech stars right now, uh, seed stage, and hopefully we'll get uh, series A and above too. But with the, the, the objective of this, you know, kind of interview podcast style interview is to get your opinion on how early stage founders can grow and all the, you know, vulner vulnerabilities and difficulties that they faced, you know, um, and they could learn from you. But yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Yeah, sure. It's great to be here. And um, I recognize a couple of names in the attendee list. So it's fun to, to uh, see some familiar faces or fil familiar names anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess I'll right away. So uh, I think you'd have heard of Techstars, a startup weekend that's happening in September. And the goal of Startup Weekend is to have, you know, first time founders come in and really get to work on their ideas for the first time because they don't have experience building products at this scale. Um, so one of the few questions I had as a first question is how would you recommend first time founders? Like when they're in their stage of fundraising, how would you recommend them to build relationships with, you know, people from tech stars who are really doing great jobs with founders or VCs or angels and just go about the fundraising process. I'm, I'm asking like, have you, that's one, but also have you seen any founders do this out of the box? That's really creative. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I also want to say that I think a great founder can raise money in any climate, you know, even on when VCs are tightening up their wallets. Um, my advice for having good connections to VCs and super angels or angels or incubators or accelerators, whatever, is the same as my advice for how to get written about in the New York Times, which is... You got to work on the relationship. So like for journalists, if there's a journalist you like that you admire and you'd love to have him or her write about you or your company someday, like interact with their posts and you'd be surprised, even like a famous journalist with lots of followers, if you interact with their posts on LinkedIn or Twitter or New York Times or whatever, um, many times that can cultivate a relationship and they'll reply to you. And so for VCs, what I'd recommend is meet with the VCs when you don't need money. Um, just get friends to introduce you to the VCs and say, I want to talk about generative AI because I'm doing a bunch of research in it. I know you're, you're doing a bunch of investing in it. I don't have a company right now, but I'd like to be a resource to you because I have X, Y, Z background, um, and looking just to meet other people interested in generative AI or whatever the topic is, biotech, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So just always be looking to make those relationships. I do think that warm intros are going to be a thousand times more effective than cold calling someone. So I'm a big fan of LinkedIn. If there's a VC you want to reach out to, you know, manage your LinkedIn network carefully. Um, try to be connected to people that you know. Um, if you want to meet a VC, let's say General Catalyst, and you, um, let's say Haman Tanasia, who who's CEO of General Catalyst, you want to meet him. Go on LinkedIn, find someone you know who knows Haman. And then ask that person to introduce you to him. So always work on warm intros wherever you can. And then talk to them even when you don't need them, which sounds funny, but that's a way to form a relationship. Yeah, yeah. And that makes perfect sense because when you're approaching them for the first time, um, there's no ask. It says, hey, let's be friends and learn more about what you're doing. And you can learn more about what I'm going to be doing in, in the future, too. Yeah, I would say don't say we'll don't say let's just be friends because busy people oh, okay. are friends. But just t t focus on the topic. Like if you see someone doing a bunch of healthcare investing, and you have a degree in healthcare from like a good university, or you work at a healthcare startup, just say um, I see you doing a bunch of stuff in healthcare. I'd love to compare notes. My background is this, and um, I'm just trying to stay connected to leaders, thought leaders in healthcare. I'd love to share some experiences. Yeah. And that's perfect in terms of, you know, engaging with their posts on different social media platforms. But how do you think uh, people can follow up 
like keep them in the loop, you know, uh, let's say, and, we'll, it, and I read an article about this the other day, uh, like once you're in touch with a VC or an angel, and let's say they're in healthcare, right? Uh, you, read an, you read an interesting article about healthcare on the New York Times or something like that. And you say, hey, and, and you, you know, share that article with that VC and say, hey, I, I read this article in the New York Times. Just wanted to follow up if you've read this or like those kinds of small things. Uh, do you think are helpful or just wanted to get your read on that as well? I think they can be very helpful. Um, yeah, I think they can be very helpful. Sounds, yeah. Um, so going, and before I go jump into the next question, I'm happy to take questions from you. Right, right. I'll, I'll give you one specific idea. You yeah. were referencing if you find a VC who's doing something specific, let's say um, generative AI and I don't know, some element of healthcare. One thing you can do to get attention, you mentioned like Fordham an article, a seminar article, it would just say counter opinion. New York Times thinks uh, prescription is going to work this way. I think they're dead wrong. I think this is what's going to happen. Um, like offer an opinion, something unique about you. Okay. Yeah. It's always helpful. Um, because it shows that, you know, you're capable of forming your own opinion and having like research done before you, you know, mail them in advance. Um, yeah, the whole, the whole article forward thing. Um, I do appreciate when people send stuff to me that they think is relevant to my work, but I always want them to include one paragraph up front about why should I read this article? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's great. I mean, happy to take questions from the audience. You know, Steve, uh, if you could moderate it, it would be amazing. Yeah, I uh, absolutely can. And I just wanted to quickly chime in and say that um, one of the things that I'm hearing and really appreciating is not only like how important it is to build relationships within innovation and startups, but how to be very thoughtful about it. Because I mean, so many of us are doing so many different things. Everybody's busy, but also everybody has their own particular needs and preferences. So being sensitive to those needs and preferences is for me also like really, really important. And I appreciate that about your, about your approach to things, Paul, like, you know, if we build good relationships that can lead to exponentially so much more value than just like somebody coming up to you, extending their hand and being like, Hey, I want to talk to you about, I need, I need this, I need that. It's like being very transactional is usually never a good idea. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I'm sure when, you know, you were, uh, like you were just getting started in your entrepreneurial journey, journey, Paul, there were a lot of, challenges and you know doubts that you had too like saying hey is this is what is what i'm i mean the product i'm building right now i'm having second thoughts on it um so with that angle i was thinking how how important do you think it's for like for a founder to go hey maybe i should pivot right now or maybe not uh who should i talk to i mean is this a good idea or is this the right time to pivot or should I pivot? So that kind of doubtful stage in people that yeah, think. I, yeah. I've had that early in my career. And even like today, I had a um, a breakfast meeting today with a phenomenal growth hacker. We're talking about some of the new product launches I have coming out. So I'm best known for Kayak, which I started as CTO in 2004. But I've sold five other companies too in uh, e-commerce security, customer service, consumer travel, business travel, and podcasting. So I'm six for six right now. Very proud of that stat. Yeah. Uh, I, my girlfriend will complain that I might be a little bit too confident sometimes, but I also am just always aware of the stuff I don't know about. And I'm always trying to get better and learning about uh, like growth hacking, for example, right now that I'm, I've am i been studying up. Um, I think, you know, the pivot thing, there's a similar question I sometimes get asked, which is people will say, I have 10 ideas for startups. How do I know which one to pursue? And to me, that's a similar question is my product does X. Should I pivot to Y? Cause you're trying to look at two different things. Um, the first thing like you to get product market fit, you want people paying for your product and you want it growing on its own. So you do whatever it takes to get a hundred customers, but those hundred will get you more customers. Once you have that, you have some level of product market fit and it's growing. You need to figure out, is there a cap to that growth? Like you're only getting a certain percent of a certain type of user and that's limited to a certain number of people. Do you need to go wider and all that? 
but the pivot question to me is um how much confidence does your team first of all how much confidence do you have in your team do you have a phenomenal team and then how much does your com- confidence does your team have in the current direction and if you have an incredibly strong team and they really believe strongly in the current product and they're like putting in the hours. I'm not suggesting anyone run a sweatshop per se, but like I had one of the guys on my team last night send me an updated Figma that he worked on till 2 a.m. this morning. And again, I'm not encouraging all my employees to work till 2 a.m., but but I love his conviction. You know, I love like how passionate he is about this product. And if you're if you have a great team that's passionate about the product, you're probably onto something and just keep getting it in front of more and more people. On the pivot, I've done many pivots in my career. It's unusual the first product becomes the final product because to be a good entrepreneur, like most most startups fail for one of two reasons. Either you get toxic founders and a toxic culture and just an implosion, or they build a great product, but for a problem no one cares about. And so in creating a great company, the first thing you have to do is recruit an unbelievable team. And I've always said that magical teams create magical products and magical products create magical P&Ls. Um, so get this great team, create a product, make sure it's focused on a problem that's a really big problem that a lot of people have. But with each release of the product, version one, version 1.1, 1.2, et cetera, just see you're getting a little bit better. You're connecting with more people. Is it being shared more often? I'm a big fan of data-driven product management, which is you do what you sort of have the vision to do what you're excited about doing, but watch carefully what they're clicking on, what they're using, what they're not using, and use user behavior and analytics as a way to try different things. Yeah. Basically, data-driven decision-making uh, is, a, is a kind of sentence. That yeah, they- it's, it's team-based and data-driven. Like, I am very influenced by my team. I, you know, I'm known as a designer or someone who managed design teams, which is what my career is but I'm probably a better recruiter than I am designer. And if I recruit mm-hmm. someone that's exceptional on my team and we fight about something like I did this morning in one of my uh, product meetings, um, if that other person feels a little more strongly than them, I'm going to give in to them because I have them on my team for a reason. It's because I trust them. I want them to work hard. If they're passionate about something, we disagree a little bit. I let them try it. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, we have, uh, a couple of questions come in from you know a couple of people. Melise asks, uh, you know, as a founder, there will always be specs. You know, staying heads down in product and being customer centric, and driving your company forward. Uh, and your team towards your north star is imperative. How did you do it? How did I? How did I do what? Uh, I think she asks, how how are you being heads down on just product and being customer centric? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a product person. I'm, I love trying out new products, new apps, new websites, new physical products. You know, a guy on my team just told me he bought this really cool lock for his front door that has, you can unlock it with thumbprint or NFC huh. or Bluetooth or key code. And I'm kind of obsessed with it now. I'm researching like wireless locks and all that. So whenever I hear about a new product, I like to research it. When I interview people, I often will ask them, what are the apps you use most? Let's say they say TikTok. I'll say, okay, if I put you in charge of product at TikTok for the next version, you told me you love TikTok. Tell me what you hate about it. And I want to make sure that people mm-hmm. have sort of a spidey sense for what about a product will resonate with people, what they like, what they don't like, how to make it better. And I just have always enjoyed those conversations. I think at a company people model themselves after the leaders of the company and uh, hopefully they're not modeling all my bad behaviors, but (laughs) stuff that I do that I think I do pretty well that people on my team seem to evolve to work in a similar capacity is just constant rapid iteration and um, trying to do it without ego. Like, it doesn't matter who comes up with the idea. You're just trying to figure out what's the great next great idea and try it and try it. So I think starting with customers, starting first with the problem, make sure you're selling a really big problem, coming up with an idea for a product where your V1 might be terrible, but at least you have something out there which solves problems yeah. some way. 
and then talking to customers daily. You know, at Kayak, um, one thing I did there that's often been written about is, well, a couple of things. One, I hired no customer support people for like the first five years. I made the engineers do all the support, which sounds crazy. Wow. Like, why would you pay someone 100K or 200K a year to answer customer emails when you can pay a customer support person, you know, 60 or 70K a year? But I had this belief that if you make the engineers answer emails, it's going to irritate them a little bit, but they'll answer it. And when they answer it, they're going to be like, I'm so that, so sick of that question. I'm going to fix the code so I never get asked that question again. Yeah. It worked magic for Kayak, where Kayak got to the point where I remember the first time we had a million users a day. And I think we got 100 emails that day, about 100. Uh, and the reason we got so few emails is the engineers just perfected stuff all the time. So I think it's the discipline of perfection and talking to customers, see what's working, what's not working, do what you need to make them happy. I also, on the Kayak website, they've removed this after I left Kayak, but on the help pages, if you kept refreshing it every now and then, typically about 20, 30% of the time, a phone number would show up on Kayak's main help page. That hmm. phone number was a red phone which sat on my desk in the middle of the office. There was no IVR, it was a direct dial. And that phone would ring during the day. And I kind of liked it. It was like, uh, I don't know, just you had no idea who's going to call you, what they're going to call you about. And people would overhear me talking to customers. And if I wasn't around, someone else would have to grab the phone. And we dialed the percentage up and down till we made it to try to get around five to 10 calls a day, which is not a lot. But um, <laughs> it was just another way for me to learn about customers. So I think like a kayak, I had eight processes from learning about customers. The phone was one, email was another, um, face-to-face usability testing. So because we're a travel company, I would often <laughs> buy tickets, the cheapest ticket I can out of Logan, like say Boston, New York shuttle. And even when I wasn't flying, I just buy that ticket to get through security. And I'd sit at the gate and I'd chat with people. And I'm naturally pretty introverted, actually. I've, I've had to learn how to be a little bit extroverted so that I can get my ideas out there and, and learn how to improve my products. And I'd walk up to someone and I would say, um, hey, I'm a programmer and I work for a travel company. I'd love to uh, show you my new app and see if you have any questions about it. It's called Kayak. And I'd always have two phones with me. So I'd hand them one phone with Kayak on it. And then with the other phone, I'd say, do you mind if I record you so I can show the other engineers what you think of the app? And oh, wow. most times I could get people to agree. Um, and then after I would interview them, and when you do usability testing, the most important question you can say as the entrepreneur is, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? What are you thinking? And you try to get them to ask questions. And the dumb questions are the most important ones. And then when I was done, I would email that video to engineering and say, okay, let's go work on this part of the product because people don't get it. So I think, I, I don't remember the other seven or, or six or five, whatever, but I think I have about eight processes for engaging with customers. And you also want to change it up. Like humans are really good at pattern recognition. One problem with pattern recognition is if you see the same thing over and over, you become numb to it. That's why like dashboards often suck because they're too static. You need to make them dynamic and change mm-hmm. up. And the way you interact with customers need to change day to day as well, because you might get bored of just doing emailing customers every day but if I also bring people in for like, we used to do eye tracking. So we'd, we had a special monitor with um, a couple of cameras on it and the customer being one room with me. And then the other room would have 10 engineers and projected on the wall. They could see where the person's mouse was, but also see where their eyeballs are. And they could see what, what they're looking at on the screen. And that was incredibly informative. It was humbling because you'd spend a lot of time as a designer working on something you thought was like the perfect dialogue or the perfect text. And then when you do eye track and realize people don't read, they look for stuff to click. They look for the answer to their question. They don't like UI gets in the way. No one, oh, most people, maybe designers do, but 99% of people don't open a product to say, gee, I just want to play with this product and see. Yeah, yeah all the features here. They, they're using your products. They want to get something done. And uh, a lot of stuff in most products just gets in the way of that. Yeah. And talking about, you know, building software and building uh, technical projects, you were a CTO at CAG too, Paul. And so Buke asks, 
is it different? Is it a different, totally different climate now when you were CTO for CAC? You know, when you got started, is it different being a co-founder now too? No. So I've been my. If you look at the six companies that I've started and sold, my roles go back and forth between CTO and CEO. I'm like a decent CEO. There's a lot of things I'm terrible at. Um, so I tend to have to hire people around me that can do things I can't do. I'm probably better CTO than CEO. But like right now, I'm running this little venture studio, BVS, Boston Venture Studio. It's bvs.net. And I'm like an incubator accelerator that helps other people with their ideas. A studio is a little bit more arrogant, and I apologize for that, where you only work on your own ideas. And if you look at what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, like we literally are launching four companies in the next three months. And if you look at what I do every day, it's recruiting and it's doing product strategy and product design reviews. And so mm -hmm. the thing I want BVS to be known for is even in the case of if some of our companies fail, I don't want it to fail because it wasn't a good product. I want people to always say anything that comes out of BVS is beautiful, simple, clean, fast, um, and fun to use. And so I spend a lot of my time doing that stuff across our products, but then making sure I'm surrounded by the right people who are doing competitive analysis. I actually don't like competitive analysis, but I think it's important to do it. So I have someone on my team do that. Um, making sure we're looking really carefully at business model, revenue, market size, et cetera. Yeah. Sounds good. And you know, one question that I see right now is, and this is something that a lot of early stage founders struggle with is how do you get people to work on your project or, you know, build an app or, you know, hire engineers if you don't have, if, you, if you're not bootstrapping it and if you don't have investments, um, yeah. how do you sell that dream to other people? Yeah. So earlier I mentioned a question that people sometimes ask me, which is I have 10 ideas. How do I decide which one to pursue? The first litmus test is first of all, just be a magnet for talent. Always be looking for amazing people and trying to get as much time with them as, as you can. They say you're the average of the five people you spend the most amount of time with. So be be judicious about who you spend time with. And if you want to be an entrepreneur, hang out with entrepreneurs, hang out with successful entrepreneurs. But as you are cultivating your network and you have an idea, pitch your network first. If you can get someone that's in your network, meaning they're talented because you think they are, uh, who says, I love that idea. Let me help you and they work on it for free or for promised equity, um, that's the first litmus test. You're onto something. If you can't convince anyone in your network to help you out for free before you're funded, it means one of two things. Either it's a terrible idea or you're not compelling enough as a co-founder. Um, to be compelling, I'm going to anticipate the next question. How do you be compelling as a co-founder? <laughs> I think there's two things. One, it's have a track record of success. And by track record of success, I don't mean necessarily create, you know, unicorns, billion dollar companies. That's great. You know, when and if people get to that, but whatever your job is at whatever company, say you're going to do something, then do it and crush it and just have the people around see you that when you say you're going to do something, you do it and you get it done. And then the second thing is one of the most important skills of any entrepreneur is to get good at storytelling and storytelling is a skill that can be learned. If you go to YouTube and type how to be a good storyteller, you'll see there's a ton of videos up there. Um, you wanna study people that are good storytellers. You don't wanna mimic someone because you wanna develop your own style, but um, being a good storyteller can paint a vision of a future where someone says, yeah, I wanna be part of that. I wanna be part of that culture yeah. that the person is describing. I'd love to help build a company with those values. And I like the problem they're working on. And I like their commitment to saying, we're going to build beautiful software. I want to build beautiful software. So, yeah, I want to work with them. Yeah, that's interesting. And with also with the and you mentioned before that you talk to customers, you know, you cold approach them and said, hey, I'm building, you know, kayak and I really want to get your opinion on it. And you've you know, forward that to your team and you have had a bunch of feedback um, and you've with all these amount of feedbacks, how did you know which one's the most important? How did you prioritize uh, changes or updates? I mean, part of it, I'm sorry if this answer, a lot of people disagree with what I'm about to say, no, please. but um, like in all honesty, I was kind of building kayak for me. 
because I travel about 100,000 miles a year and I wanted something to work really well for me. And when I would get customer feedback, there was a little bit of positive, what's it called? Uh, positive bias, I forget the term, um, confirmation bias, where if I get emails that confirm something I thought about, I would use that and say, yeah, this is a good thing to pursue. It's not that I ignored complaints. I actually had a thing, We I have a patent on doing support by email that we, we, we did support by email at Kayak, very different than any company I've ever seen before. We didn't make engineers go log into some support console. We literally had a router that would decide who to send which email to. And it was kind of sophisticated algorithm to make sure you get the right types of emails to the right developers, some diversity, some stuff that focused. But one of the things our router did is if an email had the word fuck in it, it went directly to me. And the reason <laughs> that was, I like talking to angry customers because someone angry, all it means is they're a passionate person who had a bad experience. Yeah. If you can flip them from bad to good experience, now you have an evangelist. So mm -hmm. I would, I, I'm guilty of confirmation bias. If there's something I'm, I'm thinking about, I look for things to support the case. But I also like talking to people who hate my software too. Yeah, and, and when you're talking to these people that don't like using the software, um, I mean, do you have a goal in mind saying, hey, I need to change this person's way of thinking? Or are you more thinking in a way of, hey, okay, let's see where you come from uh, and why you're not open or why you don't think this app is good? It's usually not changing their thinking because if you have to change their thinking, choose your app, you're going to be very busy because there's not enough minutes in the day to convince everyone to think yeah. the right way. So it's more like I understand where they're coming from. And then can I make my software work so well that even if someone doesn't know tech and they have a really old phone and they're averse to installing new apps, if you get it to work for them, you get it work for everyone. So I kind of like the challenging customers. It would raise the usability bar for me. I go back to engineering and say, okay, this guy doesn't understand the concept of X, you know, whatever the thing is we're working on. We've got to find another way to position us to them. Interesting. Okay. Um, we have a question coming from John. He says, um, in all that you've been learning about AI, how do you see AI helping or hurting startups and entrepreneurs in the future? I'm so excited about AI. Um, Best for AI. First of all, as a product person, I'm just amazed at the AI tools that are out there. I've been playing a lot with Photoshop, with their generative AI, and yeah. with the ability to edit a photos by using text. Um, I'm building a generative AI company right now in the travel space, which will launch probably in November. Um, my Figma, the, the main guy on my team who's using Figma every day has a whole bunch of Figma plugins that are AI for manipulating your Figma. I just think the stack is a lot higher now and there's a lot more tools that make it faster to develop stuff. I do worry about AI a little bit. I have a presentation that some of my team just sent to me on one of our products and I read it and some of it didn't make total sense. I'm thinking to myself, did this person write this or did this person yeah. use AI to write this? Um, but at the highest level, I love it as a research tool. I use I use Bard more than I use ChatGPT because Bard is more up to date, more real time. But it's incredible how much LLMs can answer questions that otherwise would take your team weeks to answer. Like for example, I have an app called SuperShare, which is really just a demo. It's not really a company or an app yet, but it lets you share from any app. Where you share to SuperShare. And it creates a page for you with everything you shared from all your apps, helps you organize the best things you've seen across any apps. And we we're talking about Linktree this morning and saying, can this be a replacement for Linktree and how do people use it? And one of, my, one of the guys on my team said, I don't know how many people use Linktree. I went to Bard, typed it in. I said, 60 million people use it. And he goes, I don't know how many people. He goes, I think everyone using it is just uh, people for business. I don't think people use it for like they want to share their favorite things. I go to Bard. I said 40% of people use it for sharing their favorite things. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you get answers to a lot of questions. You have to 
use judgment because not all the ants are correct. They might be scraping the wrong data for it, but yeah. I just love it for research. I love it for help generating ideas and content and logos and brand concepts. So I'm a fan, big fan. Interesting. Uh, we also have a question from Senefer Mendoza. She says, Paul, how did your identity as an activist then translate into hiring and, you know, board diversification, et cetera? Uh, and how did you measure the effectiveness or success of it? Of being an activist? Yeah, like, so how did that identity change, like, from an activist? I, mean, I guess a few things that you learned. Yeah, so. Hiring and, yeah. I've started four nonprofits. Uh, I'm working on a fifth one, which will launch on October, something around banned books. Um, that'll be my fifth nonprofit. And the reason I create nonprofits as companies is I like solving problems. And some problems deserve to be solved by a for-profit. Some problems should be solved by a nonprofit. Sometimes people start one path and then a year and they said, oh, actually we should be a nonprofit or actually we should be a for-profit like uh, OpenAI. Mm -hmm. Um but the thing I've realized, I'm, and I'm also on eight nonprofit boards, so I've worked with lots of nonprofits over the years, particularly the last 10 years. I'd say the thing that, the, the two things that good nonprofits have in common with good for-profits, three things. The leaders are good storytellers. They're good recruiters. And they're very focused on, are we sure we're fixing the right problem? Is this really the problem we want to work on? And if you do those three things well, you can be a successful nonprofit founder or a successful for-profit founder. So I like having both in my life. I color code my calendar and I have so many hours a week I dedicate to my nonprofit work. And every Monday, Friday, I look at my calendar for the two weeks ahead with my assistant. And I make sure there's a balance of the four colors, like nonprofit, for-profit, plus a couple other ways I categorize. And if I have a good balance, things just feel good to me. And I, it feels like every little project I work on helps inform the other project. Yeah. You said the three things is just be a good storyteller. We have a important way of sending a message um, and sharing your message and then be good at recruiting, like having the right people on your team and then just go ahead and solve the problem. Yeah. 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 Um, and one of the questions I had in, you know, talking about recruiting and, you know, delegating tasks because you know you mentioned that you get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails a day you, you know you, you mentioned you're on eight nonprofit boards you're running for-profit companies uh one of the interesting questions i had is what's your secret is there a secret sauce or what's your advice for founders on how how we would manage how they would manage time but also how they would manage stress because there's so many people that they got to put out answers to um and they have a limited amount of time a day Okay, so that's three different topics. I'll try to do all of them. Um, for time management, you need discipline. You need to think about, so every company needs a mission statement, but every human needs a mission statement too. Like what's each of your personal mission statements and what's your journey? What do you want to get good at this year and then the next five years or whatever? And on time management, you think about am I spending time on the things that matter to me that match my mission statement, that what I'm trying to improve myself as a human being and as a member of society and as a, as a father, brother, son, you know, whatever. Um, so time management is being disciplined about saying no to things that don't, that right. aren't in your mission statement. Um, stress. The way I handle that is I'm a huge fan of the serenity prayer. So the serenity prayer, see if I can remember this from memory. It's like, may God give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So on stress, so I studied Buddhism for the last 10, 15 years. And Buddhism, some people describe it as a study of suffering, that suffering is universal. And Buddhism can help you relieve suffering in yourself and your community. And one of the ways that Buddhists think about suffering is suffering is a attachment problem that you have a view of the world that isn't real and you're frustrated. Like, I wish my mom wouldn't yell at me all the time. Um, and then your mom yells at you and you get really stressed and frustrated and it causes you to go in cycles. 
But what we learn through radical acceptance is if there's something you can change, if you see something wrong in the world and you can change it, by all means, change it. If you can't change it sort of out of your power, you need to just completely accept it and just stop worrying about it. So the serenity prayer, radical acceptance, impermanence, some of those concepts have helped me get rid of stress. And even though I do get a few hundred emails a day and I'm doing all these companies, I have very little stress in my life. And I think it's for those reasons. And then the third question, let me see, was about time, stress, and what's the third part of your question? I I think that was it. Yeah, okay. stressing time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, those are things that I've never heard about, but this is really good advice. Um, and you know, we have an interesting question, and I, I relate to this question too, Paul, because I'm an international student in international student in the U.S. and I'm, I've been here here in this country for eight months, and you know, going out to net, uh, networking events every now and then have has made me build relationships with really good people. Um, and one of the few questions I have, or my friends ask me is, how do you build that connection network when you're an immigrant and you're starting, and you're starting your own business? Because the culture is so much different here than other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, how, how do you, is there a difference or advice that you could give to immigrant entrepreneurs? Because uh, we have, you know, Melise here, who's an immigrant entrepreneur as well, founder of Ecos, and I'm sure she would have a bunch of things to add to this as well. But yeah. Yeah. So where did you grow up? I grew up in the south of India, Bangalore. Okay, yeah, I've been there. Great food. Um, I just said biryani a couple hours ago. So yeah. Um, I think the first thing, as far as network, there's two ways to think about a network. There's like a friendship network and a professional network. And sometimes those blend. It's efficient when they blend, when you have friends who can be helpful in thinking helping you think about work stuff, but also be a friend. Um, I think it's just getting around the shyness that many of us have with putting yourself out there, introducing you to people, trying to help people. One way to get good friends is to be a good friend. So just like help other people all the time. I had, I worked for a company many years ago at the beginning of my career called Interleaf. We did document publishing software and document management. And there was a programmer named Kimbo Mundy. He was like my mentor. Mm -hmm. He was a monster, monster programmer. And I tried to emulate my code after his, and I tried to compete with him. And he wrote code once to try to put a quantitative score on the 200 programmers in the company, like who's the best programmer. And it was fascinating debating with him, what are all the criteria you put into such an algorithm? And one of the criteria he decided to put in was we had a very structured release mail process. When you checked your code into the system to get ready for the build, we weren't doing continuous build at that time. You could build on your machine, but then we would all integrate all the software and do like a weekly build for the whole company mm -hmm. of software. And you'd send out a release email saying this is what I worked on this week. And one of the sections of that template was um, here's who helped me. Mm -hmm. And his algorithm would look at how often you were cited, how often you helped other people. There's also the saying that if you're looking for help, ask the busiest person you know, because they're used to cranking shit out. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as like building your friend network and your professional network, the first thing is be a friend to other people and help them. And you'll find that good people will reciprocate. I know that, I know that sounds a little bit trite, but mm -hmm. that's how I find people when I'm in new environments is I find people I can help first. And then uh, through that, find friendships and professional networks. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree with, with, with Ma what Marsh commented and yeah, give first. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is great. Advice. And one of the things that I heard very early on when I came here is uh, a mentor of mine said, make a list of the people that you talk to the first week and the second week, meaning like in general, the first week and second week, and make a note of their names and what they do. And then you'll be surprised as to how many people you talk to uh, that don't really play a big part of your, in your life. But I'm not saying don't spend time with them at all, but make sure that you prioritize people that you speak with. And that was really, really strong advice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a thing where, if, let's say you work in biotech 
and you only hang out with biotech people, right? Because you're like super career focused. I think that's dangerous too, because you could be living in a bubble a bit and not know mm -hmm. more about the world. So one thing I did years ago was I started driving for Uber uh, as a way to get outside my bubble and to meet people. Wow. If you look at what I realized at the time when I decided to do this is if you look at my calendar, I would be hanging out with like tech people and then like Haitian people. I do work in Haiti. And there's a lot of people in Boston who work in sectors I never came in contact with. And that was very cool. And it's not like those, my pastors became my best friends, but I carried a notebook with me and I wrote down one sentence from every pastor and I tried to get everyone to talk. And I, most people I could get to talk and I tried to learn something from everyone. And that was super useful to me going outside your bubble and seeing what you can learn from a random person. Um, that's a fun discovery thing for me. It just opens your mind to say how other people who are not related to your field at all think. Yeah. Frida asks, curious to know who was the most interesting pe person you met through Uber. Do you, do you have a story for that? Yeah. Um, okay, I met a, um, a girl from China. She was probably like 12 years old. She's with her mom and her aunt. And I drove them, the ride was about half an hour. And the whole time I just talked to the 12 year old, the mom and the aunt didn't really speak much. And I said, somehow they, they brought up their visiting from China. And I said, that's awesome. You know, I'm, I'm really interested in China. So I love having visitors from China to our city. What made you pick Boston? And she said, I want to go to MIT. And I figured if I go to high school in Boston, I get a better shot. So I'm here interviewing at high schools. And I said, well, I teach at MIT, <laughs> and if you teach, which I, I was in the faculty at Sloan at the time. And she said, if you teach at MIT, why are you driving Uber? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I said, I have a lot of parts to my life. You know, I'm a tech entrepreneur. But I thought it was interesting that this 12 year old was so career focused and education focused. She convinced her mom and her aunt to come with her to Boston to go meet a whole bunch of schools. So that, that was cool to me. Interesting. Huh. Send for us, Paul. What's your Uber rating? <laughs> I'm going to show you. So you, so you, hold on. <laughs> so I'm going to open my Uber driver app, which is a separate app. Yeah. Let's see if you can see this. This is 4.36. No, 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 no. Hold on. Oh, 4.96. Wow. Yeah, I'm 4.96. Yeah. Very proud of that. I do wonder about who didn't give me a five. <laughs> Maybe the conversation didn't go really well or something. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple stories. I drove someone on a drug deal once. Oh, uh, my God. That, ride, that ride didn't go well. And then I drove a couple guys. I'm not going to tell you what country they were from, but they were visiting Boston. And I was dropping off at a club. I said, how do you like Boston? And they said, it's cool, except all the women are bitches. And I said, all the women? They mm -hmm. go, yeah. I go, man, if it's all the women, they might not be the problem. <laughs> yeah. I Did guess they... the guys didn't give me five stars. <laughs> they wouldn't have given me. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, yeah, Karen says, you can check in the settings privacy. I was a five-star writer for so long, huh? Until I couldn't find Logan Airport pickup area. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, right now, uh, these are great questions. I'm open to, you know, putting people on stage and having them ask questions and then, yeah, wrapping, wrapping the session up. Um, guys, if you have any questions, just please feel free to put it in the chat and I could uh, get you on. Um, I think Buke seems to have a question. I'll just get her on. Hey, Buke, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you for having me on. My question is about, well, SuperShare app you mentioned or any other app that you use a lot these days, what would you change about them? Oh my God. Um, let me see. Let me, I'm just gonna look at the apps I use a lot on my phone. So like most people, I like Instagram. Um, I hate Instagram stories. I just want them to go away. I want them to be a setting, say, don't ever show me a story because mm -hmm. 
I'm in certain content consumption mode and I look at Instagram because I like photos and seeing where my friends are and what they're doing. I don't have time to watch a video of everyone. So I end up muting everyone one by one. I mute everyone's stories. That's annoying to me. Um, I wish, so I think my iPhone, I have an iPhone 14 Pro. I think it has something like a 48 megapixel camera, some crazy number like that. I wish Instagram had full res photos so I could zoom in and crop them. Um, I wish, I don't know, there's a couple things come to mind with Instagram. Let me talk about another app I use all day, which is Gmail. I'll tell you something I hate about Gmail, and it's a problem I'm working on, which is, so I get about 300 emails a day, and a lot of them are spam. And the thing that offends me the most is when some sales, it's not that some salesperson emails me, like, I get it, they have a job, they're trying to sell so they can feed their family. But when they email me like five or six or seven times and saying, just one more time, I want to make sure you read my message, that irritates me. <laughs> because when you're trying to keep up with all your email and you're getting all these salespeople calling you all the time, emailing you once and twice and three times and on and on and on, that's insane. So yeah. I'm building a solution for that. It's going to be called Blade, which is the name of one of my old companies. Um, and you'll be hearing about it soon, but it's going to solve... I think it's going to solve, largely solve the spam problem. It's a different way of thinking about spam than the way Gmail thinks about spam. And uh, yeah. I, I'm using it now and it's devastatingly effective. You'll hear more about it soon. Yeah, yeah. Put a few questions in the chat. So, and this is very, very, this is the most important question of the day, Paul. Is your money on Zuckerberg or Elon for the MMA fight? Oh my God! One, it's never going to happen because Zach no, because Elon knows his, he would get his ass kicked. Um, yeah. I think Elon. I love my Tesla, but I think Elon is a tool. Um, I can't. St I I can't stand the way he fired people at Twitter. Like, do you have to be the richest person in the world and an asshole? Like, can he try to be the richest person in the world and like a decent human? Um, mm -hmm. he wonders why his revenues are cut in half, but you look at his tweet stream and, um, he just posts like really terrible things. So like if I was a fortune 100 company, do I want to be known with a brand run by a guy who posts such offensive shit all the time? I think he's a total tool. Zuckerberg, I kind of like, except I do blame Facebook for the divisiveness in the country and the 2016 and election, all that. And I think they, yeah. it's incredibly clear that Facebook knew they were stirring shit up and they knew there were some bad actors, but they liked the clicks and the controversial stuff got the clicks and they optimized for that. So for that reason, I'm not a Zuck fan anymore. Yeah. I was having my money on Elon. So hopefully. I don't think so. I mean, just look at photos. <laughs> um, yeah, that's true. I've seen Zuckerberg do a lot of things, but yeah. Zach looks pretty ripped. Yeah. <laughs> but very serious about mixed martial arts. Yeah. But yeah. One question I had from, from my friend Frida. Hey, Frida. Thanks for coming on. I shared an interesting question about uh, AR, VR. Frida, do you want to go ahead? Marsh says, oh, yeah. go ahead, Frida. Um, this is a really general question I have because we are currently building a mobile app, but we see potential in using AR VR in the future. So I um, was wondering what's your view on AR VR, especially with the launch of Apple Vision Pro? Will that have similar growth uh, trajectory to Apple Watch or iPhone back to um, decade ago? Yeah, so I think. AR VR is terrible right now. I've had an Oculus Rift for a while, an Oculus 2, and um, it's terrible because the hardware is so bad. Like, it doesn't really look like reality. The graphics are chunky. Um, things move slow. It's just, like, terrible. The demos I've seen at Apple look like it's a generation ahead of Oculus, but still not perfect. It's still not flawless resolution and flawless speed, but it's way better. I started reading a couple of patent applications that Apple did for the Vision Pro, and I was interested in all the cameras they have in it. 
It's insane the amount of innovation that Apple has done to bring this device to market. So, for example, many of you have no, know this, but like if you pick up a water bottle that I have in front of me and I look at it and I go to pick it up, your pupils dilate slightly. Are they, are they uh, constrict slightly to focus in on something that you're about to touch or move? So Apple knows this. And in the Apple Vision Pro, when you're looking at icons, your eye basically, your pupil contracts a little bit with the one you want to click on. They know what you want to click on before you click. Like, who would have thought of that? That's crazy. There's just a lot of innovation there. So I'm excited about it. The biggest problem is going to be cost. There's a lot of hardware in there, so the thing's going to be crazy expensive. The question is, when will there be more and more chip innovation and more integration so that the cost can be really low? But it's definitely coming. Like, I really want the day when I meet someone on the street and my eyeglass shows me their name and maybe a reminder about the last time I met them. I would love that. Yeah. And I know that's coming. <laughs> I mean, Google Glasses promised that 10 years ago, but Google Glasses were kind of shitty. Here's yeah. some pictures about that. Yeah. And Paul, you, you already have a customer for Blade. Marv says he would need to use Blade for his ocean email. Uh, but yeah. Uh, Karen asks, do you have any advice for kickstarting a consumer marketplace without paid marketing? Oh. A consumer marketplace. So the problem with building a marketplace is you have to have both sides, buyers and sellers. I would kind of split my team into my commercial team and have, and I don't know if it's technically buyers and sellers like a real marketplace or if you're using that term to mean a two-sided where there's two types of operators, but I would split my commercial team into serving each of the two communities and race against each other with getting demand, getting users on both sides. All marketplaces have this problem. So Uber was very scientific about it because they had to have enough drivers and they have enough passengers and when they launched in the city, they would move up the drivers and the passengers. And they'd, they'd ha you have to balance that. So I'd have some competition in your company with who can grow their side of the marketplace faster. Um, the nice thing about a marketplace is once you have critical mass and you have enough people from both sides, it's incredibly hard to, to defeat you. You look at Craigslist. Craigslist is a terrible website. I mean, it's really ugly Maybe and is. shit. But the reason it dominates, people are picking away at it vertical by vertical. But the reason Craigslist is as big as it is, is that's where people are. And if you're looking for someone for an odd job or you're trying to sell something or buy something, there's so many people on Craigslist that you get better visibility there than if you post it on something new that's a cooler product but doesn't have the users yet. So I guess my first thing is just set up a competition, have – half your team building one half of the marketplace, half building the other part of the marketplace. And you just do traditional growth hacking stuff where your focus should be on, can you get your first hundred users to bring more users? And if not, why not? And have each side of the marketplace studying that. Why haven't your first hundred users got you more users? Yeah. And Fira says, so is Reddit. Their app is pretty crappy. People are unbundling Reddit now. Yeah. I was, a, I was an ex- Reddit user, but yeah. Why X Reddit? Uh, the upvote. I don't like the upvotes and downvotes in that app because you can't see the downvotes. At least for for the update that I had, you couldn't see the how many upvotes and downvotes you had, or sorry, the downvotes you had. And then the comment section is they almost ban every single comment. Maybe because you know people are offensive and everything, but um, I just go on the meme subreddit and I see and everything's banned, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Reddit is as good as the subreddits you choose. Um, I like Reddit. I go on it probably two or three times a week. Um, I have a bunch of humor, Reddit, subreddits that I follow. I like Reddit. I do like, um, that's an example of something that's really old school. UI. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what's. But it's still kind of cool. I do worry about online forums. Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, on uh, 
how you keep out the assholes, but how you also make sure you're not living in a bubble. Yeah. And man, that's a hard problem. I think that's a good opportunity for people to work on because the big companies haven't figured it out yet. Mm. If someone can figure out how to like get rid of all the assholes that are online. So people are open-minded and friendly and trying to help each other is what you want. Um, but also not keep people in bubbles. Like people can respectfully disagree. That'd be a cool site. If someone can figure out how to do that. There you go. And I'm going to work on that from now. <laughs> yeah. Paul, uh, I don't think we have time for any more questions. It's exactly 3 p.m. I, I want to thank you for you know coming on and answering questions and being as conversational as you can and as friendly as you can. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll just hit stop record now.